Yeah, so thanks everyone for coming in person and online. This is our first, I guess, biannual, biannual meeting of NACAS. And welcome to the opening plenary session, Mi'kmaq and Creek Perspectives on Human-Animal Relations. And first I'd like to recognize where we're gathering in person and where our virtual guests are Zooming too. So Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, and the Dish with One Spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. The dish, or sometimes it is called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario from the Great Lakes to Quebec and from Lake Simcoe in the United States. We all eat out of the dish. All of us share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table representing that we must keep the peace. So first I'll introduce Margaret Robinson, who is a two-spirit scholar from the Eskegawage district of Mi'kma'ji and a member of the Lennox Island First Nation. She is a tenured associate professor at Dalhousie University in the Chabuktuk or Halifax, where she holds the tier two Canada Research Chair in Reconciliation, Gender and Identity and coordinates the Indigenous Studies program. Margaret has been vegan since 2008 and is a proud auntie and lives in Sessatuk. Did I do that? Okay, <laughs> with a human and two cats. Her talk is entitled, Singing Them Back to Life, Perspectives on Reincarnation, Igmigma, Oral Tradition. So welcome, Margaret. Test. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Gwe, hello. I'm delighted to be invited to join you here at the North American Association for Critical Animal Studies. I particularly like to thank uh, Kelly Struthers Monford and Chloe Taylor for bringing us together. I'm glad to be back in Toronto in the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. I did my graduate work and started my research career in the city, and today I'll be talking about elements of reincarnation in Mi'kmaq stories. I'll start with a note about language and by apologizing for my atrocious Mi'kmaq. Um, Mi'kmaq is not my first language, uh, but I'm attempting to learn it to, uh, and bring it back into my family, and uh, I'm happy to be corrected if you happen to know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> so let's so start in. Uh, I'm a two-spirit Mi'kmaq woman and a member of Lennox Island First Nation. Uh, it's one of the little red arrows pointing to it there uh, uh, on Prince Edward Island, lying in the water is the territory. Uh, my parents were James Robinson and Heather McLean, and I spread from Eskigawage, which is Skin Dressers District in Mi'kmaq, my unceded home territory, where the Mi'kmaq have lived for at least 13,000 years. Uh, that's it there, the lower uh, red arrow. Our territory encompasses what settlers call Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, eastern and northern New Brunswick, and parts of the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec. The name Mi'kmaq is derived from a 15th century greeting, Nigama, used to welcome visitors. It's not really used anymore. Uh, it means my related friends or my kin friends, sometimes it's called. The Mi'kmaq generally call ourselves the Olnu, which means the human beings. There are over 600 First Nations with distinct histories and locations, and Indigenous nations differ significantly from one another sometimes. For this reason, my work does in no way describe the Indigenous perspective. It's only my perspective. When I talk about beliefs, practices, or viewpoints, I'll specify the nation to which I'm referring, and most of the time that'll be my own, the Mi'kmaq nation, as it's the one I know best, although we're not a homogenous group either. My interest in critical animal studies is about values. It stems from trying to work out how do I embrace Mi'kmaq values in an urban context, especially if I'm outside of my home territory, like when I was staying in Toronto to do my schoolwork. So I start by engaging our stories and analyzing them to see what sort of values can be gleaned from those. I see this as a back and forth motion between cultural engagement and theoretical reflection, like waves lapping on a shore. What exactly do I mean by reincarnation? Literally, the term means to have flesh again. 
Beneath a belief in reincarnation, though, lie ontologies, which are culturally specific views about what a human being is. For the purposes of this talk, when I say reincarnation, I'll refer to an ontology, a way of thinking about being human, in which the same individual may have more than one flesh and blood lifetime. Before I started elementary school, a very sweet natured cat named Buffy lived with my family. We adored Buffy, but he had a particularly close relationship with my dad. Buffy died when I was five. Later, I noticed my father feeding a crow on the regular. When I asked him about it, he explained that Buffy had returned to him, this time as a bird, and he found this amusing because Buffy had enjoyed hunting birds as a cat. I had never heard such an idea before and didn't expect it to come from my Catholic father, but it, struck, it stuck with me. Later, as an adult studying theology, I would wonder how his viewpoint matched with Catholicism, which had been the professed religion of most Mi'kmaq since Grand Chief Membertu was baptized in the 15th century. One explanation I considered is a Catholic concept called enculturation, which describes the adaptation of Christian teachings and practices to non-European cultures. However, in this case, the Mi'kmaq people adopt some Catholic beliefs while also preserving their own ideas about what being human is all about. Within the Mi'kmaq language, Naomi Metallic has noted that the suffixes ok and ak are used to indicate someone whose consciousness is no longer present and can refer to someone who is physically absent or someone who's deceased. She gives the example here. Ina Gugwe's Metallic is Naomi's late father. Metallic notices the suffix used to indicate a deceased person is also used to indicate a container, giving the example of melagechka, milk, and malagejuok, milk bottle. She notes her late father theorized that this linguistic practice might be recognizing the human body as a container for the soul. There are a number of examples of animal reincarnation in Mi'kmaq stories. The first of these I encountered was in the story of Nagumi and Fire, which describes reincarnation resulting from prayer. In this story, Nas Naguset, the sun, warms the dew on a rock, creating a grandmother for Glooskap. Glooskap's sort of our cultural hero in Mi'kma'ki. The story indicates that Nagumi could not live on plants and berries alone and needs meat to eat. So Glooskap asks his friend Martin to sacrifice himself to feed the grandmother. Upon Martin's death, however, Glooskap feels regret, and he and his grandmother ask the creator, Gosulg, to return Martin to life. The story reads, Martin was brought back to life so he could return to his river. But where Martin had laid on the ground previously was now the body of another Martin. This story expresses three aspects I often see reflected in Mi'kmaq stories and in our broader culture. The first is regret at animal death. The second is a belief that animals willingly sacrifice themselves to feed the Mi'kmaq. And the third is the belief that the dead can return in a new body. Animal self-sacrifice and reincarnation also appear in a story called Diem's Promise. In this tale, a Mi'kmaq family close to starvation after a hard winter prays for food. In response, a moose appears and offers them a bargain. He told them that if they treated the moose with respect by taking the moose only when in need, by making offerings over the body of the moose, by using all parts of the animal, and by treating as sacred even the bones of the moose, he would always return to feed the people. If they disrespected the moose, however, then the moose would leave and never return. When I initially encountered this story, I assumed the moose was positioned as speaking on behalf of all moose, uh, as a representative of the species, functioning as a personification of moose in general. Since doing more study on animal reincarnation, however, I now note the singular he when referring to the moose in the story. And I wonder if it might be a deal between an individual moose and generations of Mi'kmaq. Regulations against hunting during the late winter, spring and summer so that moose can reproduce and grow indicate that views on animal reincarnation coexist with an awareness of the reproductive cycle of the animal. Perhaps the most interesting reincarnation story from my mind is called Man Singing to Animals. The tale is reported in a 1925 article by settler folklorist Elsie Parsons. In this story, seven men, a culturally significant number, come across a wigwam, uh, a house, and ask to stay overnight. The man inside, who some versions claim has been alive since the beginning of time, 
explains that they are too busy to host people right now. Overnight, we are singing, he said. The bones of the animals you have in the woods, I'm singing for them to get their life back. He puts out the fire, he sings. He takes out a moose bone, the moose jumps out. Caribou, mink, all come back to life. This man, Wisiskedmu Nuwasis, Chinam, animal brings back man, animals bring back man, makes them all live. Now, uh, when uh, ideally, I would have learned these stories uh, from my family, uh, being told during a cycle of the year with stories attached to particular times of year. But because of residential school, uh, a lot of that transmission of story didn't happen. And so uh, we often have to turn to settler folklorists or other folks who have recorded some of this material. Um, but of course, the translation is always an interpretation and the recording is done with a settler audience in mind, not a Mi'kmaq audience. And so uh, it's important to read many of these reports of uh, Mi'kmaq stories with a, what we call a hermeneutic of suspicion is sort of a resistant reader. Another version of the story has the man invite in the visitors and they settle down for the night, but then he proceeds to beat a birch bark drum and sing all night long. In the morning, he explains, this is my work. I don't like to see people waste any part of the animals. When they cannot save, they should bury. When he takes them to the river and shows them some fish in the clear water, these are my fish, he says. They come from all parts. People throw away on the shore. I sing for them and they come back. There we go. This story frames reincarnation not as a natural inevitable process, but as requiring the instigation of human ceremony. To contextualize these stories, we need to relate them to broader Mi'kmaq values and worldviews and to work done by other scholars. One article I examined reports a conversation held in Mi'kmaq around the year 1740 between Catholic priest Pierre Maillard and an unnamed Mi'kmaq man who was a Bo'an, a person of great spiritual power. Describing the Mi'kmaq way of life before the arrival of the Europeans, the Alno Bo'an told Mayer, we killed only enough animals and birds to sustain us for one day. And then the next day we set out again. Here the speaker is describing subsistence hunting practices called nadukalimk. The term is sometimes translated as gathering provisions, sometimes as sustainability, and even as hunting and fishing. Settler scholar Russell Brand, Russell, ugh, sorry, Russell Barsh suggests that Nadukalimk is related to the Mi'kmaq prefix Nudqua, indicating insufficiency, and reflects the idea of avoiding not having enough. But at the core of Nadukalimk are the values of respect, responsibility, relationship, and reciprocity. At that same, as that same Olnu man is reported to have told Mayar, it was a religious act among our people to gather up all the bones very carefully and either throw them in the fire when we had one or into a river where beaver lived. The man indicates he doesn't know the reason for this practice, that uh, this was just something that their elders had told them to do. But the ancestors used to tell us we must throw all the bones of the beaver we ate into rivers where we could see beaver lodges. So the lodges would always be there. All the bones of game we got from the sea had to be thrown into the sea so that the species would always exist. Here again, the reincarnation of animals seems to rely on human intervention. The idea that everything is alive is foundational to the Mi'kmaq outlook. We're sometimes described as having an animistic worldview, meaning we view the world as imbued with sentient life. Not only animals, but plants, rocks, water, geographic locations can have an identity, a personality, and a spirit. This is a slide from Mi'kmaq lawyer, actor, and educator, the late Candy Palmiter. She identifies key aspects of Mi'kmaq spiritual traditions, including the idea that life is created, that all beings have souls, and are therefore all equal. The creator spirit, called Gazulg, makes the universe and imbues it with life. This is an active, ongoing process. As the Mi'kmaq Association for Cultural Studies explains, all things, plants, animal, people, and the earth itself, all have the creator spirit in them, and therefore they must be respected. And because everything on earth is connected, no part should be exploited or abused. The Mi'kmaq worldview is of a universe constantly changing. 
This comes through linguistically as Mi'kmaq is a verb-based language. So for example, instead of saying it is green, which suggests a fixed state of greenness, Mi'kmaq says it is becoming the color of a fir tree. Activity and change undergird our understanding of all forms of being, including that of humans and other animals. Palmer estimates that 85% of the Mi'kmaq are Roman Catholic. This point is significant for my topic because belief in reincarnation contradicts and overwrites Roman Catholicism. For those of you unfamiliar with Catholic doctrine, uh, at least seven early church leaders wrote against reincarnation. One of my favorite rejections is from Bishop Basil of Caesarea, who writes, avoid the nonsense of those arrogant philosophers who not blush to liken their soul to that of a dog, who say they have themselves formerly been women, shrubs, or fish. Have you ever been, have they ever been fish? I do not know, but I do not fear to affirm that in their writings they show less sense than fish. And in the year 197, Tertullian, a Christian writer from Carthage, directly connected reincarnation to food. Come now if some philosopher affirms that a man may have his origin from a mule, a serpent from a woman, they should abstain from eating animal food? May anyone have this persuasion that he should abstain, lest by chance in his beef he eat some ancestor of his? Tertullian is mocking the idea, but I find it interesting to see a vegan or proto-vegan idea here in circulation, um, really only uh, 197 over 2,000 years ago. It's um, interesting to see how Mi'kmaq beliefs in animal and human reincarnation might be ways of resisting attempts to chain our cosmology and align it with that of Europeans. Despite the large percentage of Catholic Mi'kmaq, I've encountered nothing that suggests a belief in reincarnation should be denied or abandoned for faith-based reasons. More commonly, Mi'kmaq adopt Catholic beliefs where they already align with their own traditional views. A belief in heaven, for example, coincides with the belief that there is a world above the sky where ancestors reside. When I have asked other Mi'kmaq about this belief in reincarnation, they've indicated it also applies to human beings. I was firmly told so. One Mi'kmaq colleague, Suli and Marshall Johnson, told me humans and animals both reincarnate until they live a life of no regrets, at which point they go to Wasuk, heaven, to live with the ancestors. The Mi'kmaq aren't alone in viewing animals as reincarnating. Settler anthropologist Antonia Mills reports having identified 10 indigenous societies in North America that expressed a belief in animal reincarnation. Similar views are reported by Judd Sojourn, assistant professor at the Center for Native Studies in Michigan. In a story about a character named Clothed in Fur, the hero has conflicting desires over a muskrat who is also his sister-in-law. He respects her as a relative, but his desire to eat her wins out. The author reports that, provided none of the joints in her body are damaged, the sister-in-law comes alive again after her bones are given back to the water. It is understood that her body appears again around these bones. The process appears to be automatic, not initiated by human ceremony. Sojourn offers a speculative explanation for the prohibition of dismembering an animal body, and also reports a protocol against giving animal bones to dogs, which we also have. If the joints are not broken, he writes, the bones stay together, making it easier for the musculature of the animal to reestablish itself around the skeleton. To reestablish itself around the skeleton. For the same reason, bones are not given to dogs, so that the skeleton may be reused by the same animal that were kind enough to give themselves over for a time to be eaten by human beings. Sojourn further describes the tension between killing animals for food and acknowledging them as kin relations as foundational to much Anishinaabe storytelling. Further, Sojourn proposes that bonds of love and friendship, but also of pity, of animals pitying humans, motivate an animal to give its body to a hunter to be used as food and suggests that this occurs repeatedly, that it's not the hunter is good at catching moose in general, is good at catching that particular moose. Sojourn writes that this belief makes hunting bearable while allowing the hunter not to lose sight of the fact that animals are kin. There are three directions I'd like to explore next with this idea to further flesh out, so to speak, my understanding of reincarnation and Mi'kmaq thought. The first of these is Mi'kmaq cosmology related to worlds. There are six worlds in the Mi'kmaq cosmology, and I'd be interested to explore how these relate to a spirit's return to flesh. One of these is the earth. Uh, there's an area below the earth. There's an area above the earth. 
uh, there's an area above the sky and so on. And so I'd be interested to know uh, what are the logistics of how people imagine these souls transmit or, or move between these different spheres? And uh, does moving from one world to another necessitate a new body? Uh, or is it the same body that moves from one world to the next? The second thing I'd be interested in exploring further is descriptions of reincarnation that differ slightly, um, indicating different forms of rebirth. Uh, I'd like to examine these forms in greater detail. In writing about the Gixan, for example, Antonia Mills describes some young people who are identified as reincarnated ancestors, even in cases where the death of those ancestors occurred after the birth of the child, and instances where ancestors were identified as both being reborn into new bodies, but also simultaneously present in the afterlife to assist their descendants. One explanation for this in Mi'kmaq might be multiple elements within each individual that have different names or uh, elements of the what we might call the soul or the spirit that are named differently and seen as functioning differently in relation to the body. And then finally, I'd like to see how these ideas might be expressed in protocols associated with the death of animals and of human beings. Uh, the first of these within hunting protocols in terms of uh, how do the belief in reincarnation of animals and the importance of returning bones to the place where that particular animal lives, uh, how do these come forward in hunting protocols? What kind of belief can we infer from some of the protocols? And the second in kinship practices and funereal rites. Uh, so for instance, the tradition of burying a Mi'kmaq person with many of their belongings indicates the expectation that that person will require those belongings in the new place to which they go. I'll stop here and thank all of you for your time and attention. I look forward to our discussions over the next few days and to hearing from the other speakers. So I'll say, well, thank you all. Thank you, Margaret. So next I'll introduce Darcy Lindbergh. So Darcy Lindbergh is mixed roots Plains Cree with his relations coming from Sansom, Samson Cree Nation in Alberta and the Battleford area in Saskatchewan. He is currently an assistant professor with the University of Victoria's Faculty of Law. Darcy has taught courses on constitutional law, indigenous legal traditions, treaties, and indigenous environmental legal orders. He has previously been called to the Yukon and British Columbia bars and practiced in the Yukon territory. His talk is The Critical Questions Within Cree and More Than Human Relations. Welcome, Darcy. Thank you, thank you Sally. And I'm, I, I'm just going to talk. And if people can't hear me, you can let me know. Uh, yeah, I, people on Zoom can, and I, I assume people in the room. And I also have a PowerPoint as well. And so I hope I can get uh, sharing capabilities, the power to do so. So um, I'm hoping I can get, can be able to share my screen, but as I Should do- Should be that, good to go now. Okay, thank you. There we go. It's been, seems so long since I've done this. There we go. Um, so really grateful to get this invitation to speak there. And I, again, you're gonna have to let me know if you can't see the screen, um, but uh, it is really wonderful to hear um, Margaret's talk. And um, it's as though we, talked before on how um, our, our presentations would be synchronistic with each other, because um, some of the themes that uh, Margaret talked about are within mine as well, but that really goes to the strength of, we didn't talk before, but that goes to the strength of what we think about um, Indigenous laws and constitutionalism, um, Mi'kmaq and, and Cree share a similar language for Algonquin languages. And some of these values that Margaret talked about will flow into some of the things that I'm going to talk about well. So um, excited for that here as well. And I also wanted to um, engage with this idea of, of using stories um, for critical uh, questions about our relations with um, the more than human world. I'm borrowing that from a colleague, that term, um, thinking of non-human agents, beings, and things there. And I wanted to start out and hopefully finish with a story. 
And so this, this is my first time actually telling this story. So I, I, you seem like a great audience to test new material out on here. Um, but I wanted to tell you the story. Um, it's, it's one of our, our um, what we talk about is one of our, I guess, cultural heroes is what some people say. Um, tricksters is another way. It's actually a lot more complex than that, but there was soggy chalk stories. And, and so I'll tell you one of these, and, and I wanted to give you something to look at here. This is Christy Belcourt's a Métis artist, um, lovely creation, as, as, as they have many of those here as well. Um, and the story begins with Wasagi Chak, um, who's gone through this journey of helping making the world safe for humans. Um, so he's got a puffed up chest, thinks that he um, can can walk into any village and demand anything. And so that's what Wasaki Chak does, goes to this village and, and says, um, I'm hungry. And, and the first person that he comes upon is what we say as a, is an Esquio, an old woman, um, and says, I'm Wasagi Chak and I am hungry, feed me. Um, and the old woman who is well aware of Wasagi Chak and who they are, um, and more so of Wasagi Chak's vanity, um, teases him by pretending not to know who Wasagi Chak is. He says, I don't know who you are. Why should I feed you? Um, so Wasagi Chak gets angry and goes on demanding that this old woman acknowledge, first acknowledge who he is and also feed him. Um, so this old woman, um, again, playing along and, and seeing Wasagi Chak growing angry and angry says, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to go ask Two Loons because Two Loons has the best memory knows everything, has a much better memory than you, Wasagi Chak. And so this just makes Wasagi Chak angry. So this, this woman goes to see two loons. The joke is that the woman is two loons. And what the woman does, she gets to this lake and in the story it's called Double Shot Lake. And she jumps into the lake and goes underwater for a very long time. And when she returns to the surface, um, she is a loon. She comes to the surface as a loon. And so what, what occurs there, um, this goes on. And so the loon says, I don't know who you are with Sagi Chak. I, I'm not going to feed a stranger. Our, our, our nourish, the things we nourish on here is, is, um, is scarce. And so growing anger and anger, um, the story can go on forever. I'm going to truncate it here. Um, uh, Wasaki Chak uses his powers to remove Two Loon's ability to remember the names of things, including animals. And so this becomes a, a, an emergent situation for the community because this occurs for a few days. And what occurs is Two Loon's has actually got a very important part in this community that they call in buffalo um, to be hunted and for nourishment. And so um, what, as after she loses her ability to recall these names. Um, Wasagi Chak turns himself into a buffalo and returns to the village. And he asks Two Loons, what's my name? And she says, Buffalo Horns. And then Two, two Loons notices that everybody in the village is, is worried because she can't speak the name of, of what the buffalo is. Um, so Wasagi Chak answer, asks again, what is my name? And she cries out, Buffalo Sinew, Buffalo Eyes, Buffalo Voice buffalo hooves, and so on and so forth, but can't just say buffalo, right? Um, and so Wasagi Chak is delighted, and he, he tells her, I'm making it so that you're the only one who can call buffalo in close. You have this power, but you can't remember my name, so we're, we're never going to come close to you. Um, and so the story goes on um, in the telling. It's a longer story. The community gets very worried. They run out of food. They can't nourish themselves because buffalo is one of those relations. So finally, what Two Loons does is dives back into the lake. And while they're in that lake, somehow they're able to remember all of these stories about buffalo. And when they come out of the lake at the last time, they come up. And according to one version of the story, it happens four times, which is a culturally significant number for Cree. And the last time when they come up, they have this song. And they sing the song and it's the song is full of buffalo. It's describing their lives, what they do, um, how they live together, everything that two loons can remember about buffalo's living. And with that, the buffalo who are not Wasagi Chak, all the other ones are, are pleased with this. And according to the story, come back to the village. And um, as Margaret mentioned in, 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 in one of that beliefs um, for the Mi'kmaq, there was this belief that these buffalo were giving themselves to the to the people as well to share for their nourishment as well. 
And so um, that's really how the story ends. Um, there is a humorous end with our Wasagi Chuck stories. There always is about Wasagi Chuck running away in fear now because um, he can be hunted and, and, and so forth. There's more to that as well. But I wanted to start with that story um, because um, I wanted to, I'll get to what we use our stories and often um, for those who are in um, or law professors um, or within um, the legal community, know that um, stories um, um, are an integral part of how we look at indigenous laws. And um, I also wanted just to put forth the critical analysis that we can do through our stories here as well. And so our Wasagi Chalk stories, they really give us this journey into critical thinking. Um, and so um, in my, um, I guess, um, knowledge of Wasagi Chalk stories, so I was told Wasagi Chalk stories as a child, they were often like that one, um, very um, playful and um, entertaining. And it wasn't until I grew older that I could start to see what I was being taught within those stories. Um, those principles that were within them. And there was two cycle, there's two parts to Wasagi Chalk cycles. And the first one is this idea about the creation of the world to be safe for humans. So Wasagi Chalk, that's where they gain this hero quality for Cree people in that they're able to make the world into this place where um, humans can live amongst other animals um, and um, other natural beings without fear of death, violence, and harm as well. And then there's the second part of, of this Wasagi Chuck cycle, which is that, that story that I just told you belongs to. It's really the folly some, the, the foolishness, the absurdity, the um, hubris of Wasagi Chuck that occurs there as well. And so there's all sorts of stories there, not just the one that I've told you. There's one where Wasagi Chuck tricks ducks out of its feathers, only to end up, um, pardon my language, burning his own ass with a steak. Um, that, and this is the story, it scabs up and he eats his own scab. So not for, uh, sorry if anybody's eaten recently there. Um, there's another one about losing friendships with dogs and, and so on and so forth. And the other thing about these Wasagi Chuck stories is we can actually tell new ones as well. So the late um, storyteller, writer, author, lawyer Harold Johnson often would start his talks with a Wasagi Chuck story that he um, had had developed for that purpose there as well. Even the story I told you here, originally it, it involved deer, but my relations are with buffalo in my community. So I actually tell that story using buffalo uh, within there as well. And so that's, it's acknowledged that the second part of these stories, we can actually change and use them for um, our contemporary or useful purposes there as well. And so what the Wasagi Chuck cycle stories it does, it teaches that Cree law is regenerative. Um, so it offers an alternative frame and orientation to critical questions on human and non-human beings and things, those relations. So um, uh, right in the fore of, of our gathering here. Um, it also helps us understand that Cree law is reflexive. Um, and so the story that I told you, um, one of the lessons within it that I take out of it is the persuasive aesthetic of Cree law. And so when you think about that story, um, two loons, um, it's not just an authority over a name um, that causes two loons to be able to have that relationship with Buffalo, but it was that aesthetic, the able to sing a song and to draw people in. So again, that really weaving into um, Margaret's presentation as well and thinking about singing as being an important aesthetic for the practice of law. And then the, the other thing I like to talk about is Cree law has a relationship with imperfection. I'm going to get back to this uh, in the future, but um, for the, um, I don't know how, if everybody's a legal scholar out here uh, on the Zoom or not, um, but this is for the Dorkinites, uh, Dorkin, Dorkinians. I don't know what we call, call them, us. I don't know what I am. Um, but there's this idea that law can be, is this Dorkin? Somebody just say if I'm wrong with this, is that law um, can be understood by this like her, her, Herculean judge will understand every law and principle and they'll understand that as well. Cree law works from the opposite effect. It's this idea of imperfection. We're working towards our best way to live together in relationship with each other as well. If I was to put a, um, a theory to that as well. So I'll get back to that last point a little bit later here as well. Um, and so Wasagi Chak, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we think about Wasagi Chak is um, we often think about this as our first law professor from Cree peoples. Um, the, the term Wasagi Chak comes from these two terms, Sagi, Sagituin means love. Um, so loving, um, meaning like caring and loving and a chag. And so 
um, there's one teaching that Wasagi Chag is this, this loving spirit that is really striving for the best for themselves and humans, um, but also our human and, and our folly sin and their characteristics as well. So it's really interesting. I've never seen a description of Wasagi Chag's form in a story. Nobody's ever said, oh, they got, you know, legs like tree trunks or eyes this that it's always just this being that we're seeing these stories through the first person as well um and so that's again when i think about the critical theory of wasagi chak stories we enter into there as well um and um, wasagi chak really exists in this time we talk about is there a teakwina? those are our sacred stories um where the world was being shaped um with um animals um, and, um, and human along as, as animals could talk to each other. And Wasagi Chak is really transforming the world through these ideas of misadventure, love and mischief, as like you can see in the one story I told you there. And so often um, uh, there's a number of, of people, including legal scholars, will say that um, Wasagi Chak, um, another word is our elder brother, um, um, represents the legal system of law for the people as well. So there's a system in there of law within these stories. And then, um, and then, so this really ties to, um, again, we didn't plan this, but to, to um, Margaret's presentation, is the Cree word for spirit um, is a chag. Um, and it's not something that just humans have, right? Our, our inspiritedness, um, according to this line of Cree thinking, is that non-human agents, beings, and things carry and are animated by an achag, a spirit. Um, and with this um, achag, um, including humans, um, we have distinctive laws and culture. And so when you think about even, we have a long line of stories about Buffalo, where it talks about Buffalo as, as we have kinship relations and have their own laws that we work alongside with as well. And so what Cree narrative traditions do is they capture, transmit, and teach this kind of legal pluralism, if you can think about it that way. Um, that there is these non-human legal orders that are out there as well. Um, so when you look and you start to hear more stories and you put them on top of each other, you can start to see this. Um, and, and so there's critical questions that should be popping into your mind that I actually encourage people to do when we think about this, about who is interpreting stories, um, and what is there as well. And so um, another thing that I see within the story, and I just wanted to bring to the fore, is this idea of Lakotuin. And I have started to think about this as a critical philosophy of relationality. Um, and what go to win is really this overarching principle within Cree thought that um, it's the law that governs all of our relationships. And um, so there's a couple quotes here, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. Um, but the bottom one by Métis scholar um, and writer um, and elder uh, Maria Campbell um, talks about this, this, you know, she, she'll talk about her life growing up in that will go to in practices meant that they're with the whole of creation. So it was stories, songs, ceremonies, um, and dances that taught responsibilities, not only to human to human, but human to plants, human to animals, and, and human to uh, water and to the earth as well. And so this idea of, of relations is being uh, this, this, this large subset, right? Um, there. And so the question is, how do we get there, right? And so what I wanted to do is maybe this next three is really thinking about these next three slides, I believe, is thinking about how do we use stories? So for some of you, this might be the first um, instance that you've heard Cree stories as law here. And I often want to caution people from taking one story and thinking, okay, well, this is gonna tell us everything we need to know or being able to think about Cree law in a very, concrete way through there as well. And so it's really, we need to know that storing only matters to Cree law when it's in relation to supporting and supported by these other areas of Nehiel Pamatsman or, or Cree life, right? And so these are, this is a Nehiel peoplehood um, methodology um, to, to delve into the academic world a little bit more here. Um, and this is kind of where my actual academic research is, is, is that as I look at our our ASCII, our, our, our land territory relationships, our language, um, our Chimawina, um, so our stories, and also our ceremonies on how I can braid together thinking about Cree law there as well. And so that Wasagi Chak story I told you is just one small story within a whole cycle of stories, which Wasagi Chak stories are just one um, narrative tradition within a, a, a long history of Cree narratives as well, which stories are just one strand into this long 
area of pre-constitutional practices. And so really just to humble ourselves when we think about stories there. And our word actually in law, uh, for law in Cree is nehiao wiasawawina. And what that means is the act of braiding or weaving, to, uh, weaving together. And so you can think about that as like relational and lateral, that there's not one institution that is larger than the other. I often use my hair as an example that I can pull it apart at the ends here, um, really easy um, um, when it's there, but when you braid it together, it actually has a lot of strength. And that's how we think about Cree law as well. And so the story that I just told you, um, it gets its strength with its relationships to other things as well, because that's not gonna tell you everything that you need to know about hunting buffalo um, or, or the like there as well. Um, so for example, people who do hunt in our communities, they're gonna have that experience of going out there and um, taking the life of something else. Um, so engaging in that act, um, I will call that act often violence. Um, some people disagree with me, um, but also just because they're pulled by that need to provide for family, for themselves, for their community as well. And so that set of knowledges of that experience, which I don't have, I'm not a hunter, um, is gonna provide a different lens and provide strength to Cree law versus me knowing these stories, right? Um, and so we come collectively with all these things and braid them together as well. Um, to, just to give you a little snippet. And by the way, um, one of, where my family is from, I'm in Samson Cree. Um, so my Japan, my great grandfather, grandmother and my grandfather um, were born in, um, in, in Muskwachis, Hobima. Um, what they're doing back there is they have a program for young kids where they go out and they, engage in harvesting buffalo um, uh, from the area. And um, I have a friend who in, helps along with that and, and says like, it's really difficult, right? For young people um, to do that, right? And so it's, they have to work through what is going on there. And so those are really uh, what I see as sites of legal knowledge, sites of legal adaptation and sites of legal, you know, um, contestation as well, right? That we're relearning and so um, when we think about colonialism we don't have buffalo running on the prairies where we can all go out and hunt those things like that as well that we're re-piecing some of these things together so that braiding is an act in progress as well um, within Cree life that I think that these critical questions are important to engage with as well um, I'm gonna just kind of run through that one because I, I think I've made the point that um, uh, these stories are, you know, um, I'm borrowing Aaron Mills, um, who's an Anishinaabe legal scholar. His thinking on, um, on the, the link between constitutional orders and law. And the story that I told you, I would say it's at the roots, right? It's something that we take, we can interpret, and then eventually um, it, it, it unfolds into some sort of law um, if it gets up there as well. And so you can look this up and Aaron's writing is, is online as well. And I'm not gonna um, just for the interest of the time go into too detail at all, but I really love this visualization when we, we think about uh, uh, this here. And then, so, um, so I wanna return to the idea of imperfection, right? And so uh, we know Wasagi Chak um, is, is, uh, has this legacy of imperfection and, um, and also of persuasive aesthetics. And I always like this quote um, by Smith Adameo. Um, and this is Winona Wheeler's writing. So if you get a chance, I would go to Winona Wheeler's writing on Cree intellectual traditions um, that really talks about storytelling um, as well. It's really important. But what um, Smith tells us here is that um, the old people had laws for everything and the teacher of those laws was a Saki Chak. So really pointing back to um, this cultural figure as a, um, um, a bringer of laws um, but what I always find interesting about this is that um, Smith says that after he left us, so we actually have stories that Wasagi Chak goes down this part. It's actually part of Thunderchild, um, the reserve in Saskatchewan. There's this hill. It's actually called Wasagi Chak's Hill or Slide and slid down that hill and left us. And it's actually a hill that's actually used for healing. Um, but they say that Wasagi Chak left us on that hill. They would say when someone would lie, people would say, hmm, that's what our elder brother used to say. So Wasagi Chak was known as a liar. And so you had to actually tell it, tell the story really good or face humiliation, right? And so it's this idea that um, if you think about, you know, some people get troubled by, you know, the, the idea of um, sometimes fantastical stories being law. Um, but here it was this understanding that there's something deeper within there, the knowledge of, of these stories about fantasy that we are um, 
they're telling us something and teaching us something. So you have to be a really good storyteller to be able to do that, is what I get out of this. And then, um, and so that the final thing I'll say is I, you know, I want to harness in how we use stories, that there are story methods and story briefs. I'm teaching at a university that uses a story brief method. They use stories from Indigenous nations and pull out case brief them like um, lawyers do and pull out principles and, and put them together. There's a whole method and they do it in a very, um, um, in relationship with nations as well. And so they get guided along the way and there's, there's reciprocity in there. Um, and the one thing I do want to caution is, that, for example, for these sacred stories is that um, to do that, I think would be engaging for Wasagi Chuck stories, particularly um, in, um, pulling into that idea of like non-Indigenous legal theory and kind of taking the story out and putting those principles there as well. And so I really like this um, guidance by Gordon Christie here is how, where, he, where he talks about when we engage in Iranians that are founded on non-Indigenous philosophies and theories, it's really important for Indigenous scholars to maintain grounding in communities, to assess the conceptual relationships, which uh, a non-Indigenous theoretical position or argument is embedded in. And then finally, to really excise the content of non-Indigenous argument or position from these matters. And so that's why I caution people often um, and um, uh, just really to critically look on how we're using stories. And I also think this is a good way to think about this in terms of um, this biannual um, meeting that is going to continue on with a lot of hopefully more Indigenous thinkers coming in there as well, who are really coming into a line of historical um, thinking within um, critical animal studies as well. Um, so I just wanted to put that forward here. And then, so again, I wanna to return to these. Um, Wasagi Chak really, uh, uh, Wasagi Chak's journeys provides critical thinking on, um, for me, these are the things where I actually go out and question um, our stories or what um, some scholars say about law, is authority over the more than human world versus that relational level within it. And that story that I told you there, it really points us towards this idea of relationality, um, but also not to get caught up in the romanticization of relationality as well as important, as in, because if we're relying on stories to tell us our relationship is good, um, it, of course, that story was told and interpreted by me and not by our mustos buffalo relations as well. And so I always have these critical thoughts when thinking about it. how do we continue on that journey that two loons did under the surface and learning about um, non-human beings and things without saying we have some sort of authority over them as well. I also, this idea that ties into that is like violence, kinship, and voice. So we have this struggle within Cree law where we talk about our kinship with, for example, Buffalo, but also have um, enacted, quite honestly, violence upon um, a population that we have kinship as well. What does that mean, right? And those questions I really like to work through and to ask and to think about quite a bit. And then um, this really ties to our commitments and contradictions in realizing neopamatsuin. Neopamatsuin is how we think about as um, good living. Um, and again, as like a, um, a universal concept, um, we, we talk about Mio Pamatsuin within at least my family and community as belonging to everything and not just humans as well, right? And, and so um, even within that, there's this contradiction when we're relying upon nourishment um, from the world around us. How do we um, enable good living while still being able to um, rely upon that sort of nourishment, um, shelter, et cetera, those kind of questions. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go oh, to the chat here. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. And then, um, yeah. And so I wanted to return to these questions here. Sorry, I'm, I'm rusty at my Zoom game here. Try to get the chat out of my face. Oh. And yeah, and so when I wanted to return this idea of this like Cree law having a relationship with the imperfection, is it really is that? And so my critical questions that I thought I was gonna get, um, uh, I don't know, chastised for when I started engaging this because I use um, in my research, not only our stories, but some of our ceremonies as well. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm talking about this and often our ceremonies are practiced on the ground um, and in relationship with, um, 
territories and um, a lot of sort of um, confidential teachings as well, is that I thought somebody is going to come up and just be really angry with me um, in, in there. And what I actually found is that um, is that a lot of um, Cree scholars and Cree thinkers, Cree ceremonialists, it's really that idea that we are going after this, these, these questions. And so that one really critical question that I have is um, often sometimes people will have stories, kind of like what Margaret had shared, we have other stories about moose and buffalo where there's treaties created, where uh, buffalo and moose give their lives to Cree people, to Nehiao. And for me, I'm always like, is that, a, is that a treaty or how does that work, right? It's just the story. And that's a critical question I have, right? And I always thought that um, people would be angry and engaging with those. But uh, what I find is when we actually talk about it is really this idea that um, we are imperfect as beings um, and that as we continue to think about law and it has force, we actually need to think about it as imperfect. Because the second that we start to think about it and guess in that Herculean way that we lose our ability to be legal agents is, is kind of like the the, the um, philosophy that I've, I've understood within um, Cree, Cree law here. And so I want to return again to Wasagi Chak. It's a uh, Wasagi Chak is often talked about as being this prototypical human. Um, and um, it's it's no wonder that we're full of stories of the imperfection um, that Wasagi Chak uh, brings us here. And um, so I don't know how I'm doing for time. I'm just going to look for uh, Kelly. Can you tell me how I'm doing? Am I over time? Am I under time? I think you have about four to nine minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then so I wanted to end this with another story. And usually I, I spend way too much time on the story um, and I usually start it with it as well. So I've kind of gone through like my arguments on why we should um, look at Cree stories as, as critical philosophies or critical legal theory, even if you want to go that deep, is here. This is the story of Mistassini or Buffalo Child. And this story, um, again, is, is really well known um, by the Plains Cree, by the Nihiao out this way. Um, and uh, what the story is, I'm going to truncate it again is that there is this child who was lost by their, um, their grandmother, their cookum on the prairies and, and Buffalo actually take this child up and raise them. And the, there's a series of events within the story that this child um, grows up as, as a Buffalo or amongst the Buffalo, but retains its human form. And then eventually learns that, um, uh, that it, it is human. Um, but, and then eventually decides it wants to go back and live amongst the creek. And so when it goes back and lives amongst the Cree, it's just, it has a hard struggle because it must now engage in hunting against um, the family that it raised up to its herd. And so um, really it's this, this story of struggle with this, this boy and eventually chooses to go back and be a buffalo or to live amongst the buffalo. And um, so the part of the story I wanted to share for, for us here is that when this boy goes back and lives with the buffalo, um, goes to the, the one of the elder buffaloes and says, you know, I was just, it was so hard for me to live among the, the Cree because I was just disgusted. Everywhere I went it was the bodies of, of us, of mustas, of buffalo. There was hides that were um, on their tents and also their clothing. There was our meat everywhere. They used our bone for, bones for tools, um, et cetera. And so what the elder buffalo does is says, well, you know what? We, um, we have laws between us, you know, and, and so as Buffalo peoples, we, we choose to give our lives to the Cree. So because just as you are a naked baby on this prairie, um, so are they, even though they're adults, they would not be able to live on this prairie without us. And in, in, in return, um, we are given the ability to grow and to reproduce quickly. Um, and we also, amongst the Cree, they decide that they have to gift us, um, uh, leave offerings. They can't take more than we need. And they also must remember us in their ceremonies and they go and do ceremonies as well. And so in that story, it's, it's one of the few stories where they talk very specifically about law and this relationship between each other as well. And so the, how that story ends is this boy actually is still conflicted. And so what the, the elder buffalo does, it gives the boy the ability to change into a stone if it chooses to be. It says he, 
you don't want to be a buffalo because it's hard, but you don't want to be human because it's even harder, right? And so it gives this ability to change into this, this stone. And so that's what the boy does. And so um, goes through the ceremony and, and becomes the stone that we see um, here in these pictures. These pictures are over 50 years old. Um, and what occurred at the site, this was actually in the South Saskatchewan River, the elbow of it. And um, this was a site of seasonal gatherings. And so Margaret talked about, um, you know, hearing stories and seasons. That's where these stories would be shared. These relationship, these legal stories about our relationship with Buffalo would be shared there, including the story of Nastassin. Um, And so this was, again, on the land out there where they learned the story. So um, apropos of um, the relationship with Canadian law, what occurred here was um, the Saskatchewan River was dammed in 1967. And as it was being dammed, they attempted to blow up this um, stone. Um, and so it actually sits under Lake Diefenbaker now as well. And so um, uh, we're starting to see this idea of recovery and revitalization of this law um, almost materially as people return to the Saskatchewan River. And so I'm going to leave you with homework with that story. Um, you can think about um, some of the very few ideas that I, I placed upon you about Wagotuin. Um, uh, the, the boy in the story is not Wasagi Chak, it's just a boy. Um, but also this idea of, of relationships with the non-human world and the use and how do we use story as well. And so um, I just want to thank you for my time. Um, I'm grateful to be in here. I am in uh, Lekwungen territory. And um, the last thing I'll say about that is I acknowledge this territory that I'm on is that um, out my window here is another stone. It's actually an actual mountain. Um, it's not a uh, Saskatchewan or Alberta mountain. We call mountains weird things in Saskatchewan or Alberta, just large hills. Um, and up this hill, it's actually called um, in the language, um, the word, I, I'm not going to pronounce it right now, but it's called Bear Mountain. And this is the idea um, there. This was there, the mountain for bears as well. And what is occurring is that um, our mayor here, it's Langford, is I guess would be the colonial name, um, is often heard as saying, um, there's a housing shortage, not a tree shortage. They're really tearing up the mountainsides in, in here as well. And I often think about this um, in, in my relationships with the land that I'm on um, is um, how am I furthering my understanding to Cree law, but that idea of how am I being good to the relationships that the Lekwungen peoples had with the non-human world here as well. And so that's the kind of urging when you think about the story of Mastasini, the story of Bear Mountain, or any stories that you hear there as well as really start to think is how you can um, not only engage in those stories, but start to look at the roots of why these stories are important. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to talk about here. So uh, grateful again for the opportunity here and welcome any sort of um, discussions or comments that uh, uh, come from this. And I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so we have, there's a microphone on the table there. If anyone in this audience has a question, just feel free. And if not, I will monitor the chat. Give everyone a few moments. Oh, yes. Or it can be passed. Oh, I think you just have to flip the switch. Thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm Angela. Um, Darcy, it's so good to hear you tell the Buffalo story. I heard you tell it um, a couple of years ago now, and I think it was in Dalhousie when we had the first Canadian Animal Law Conference, which seems like another lifetime ago, you know? It's so nice to be able to gather in person, at least some of us in person again. It feels like really wonderful. So uh, thanks so much, Chloe and uh, Kelly, for bringing us together. I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask both speakers, actually, and it was um, to pick up on the point that Margaret was making about reincarnation and to ask how common is that um, in, within other Indigenous groups besides the Mi'kmaq? Because one of the things I was thinking about when you were describing um, it is, you know, in other religious traditions like Hinduism, like you don't, that is what it's about. It's like you don't eat animal flesh because it could be eating, you know, a human. 
um, reincarnated. And that's why dairy and egg is okay, because that's not, you know, potentially a person. Um, and I'm wondering if that, you know, does it have to do with consent then? The, the it being okay to possibly be eating somebody who could be another person. And what that sort of reminds me of a little bit, and I just more share this than ask a question about it is just, you know, in sort of cases where I've been reading a lot um, recently about um, Moby Dick and these cases of cannibalism and things at sea. And one of the things about them is that it, within sea custom, it's okay to do it as long as the person consents to doing it, or they consent to the process in which the person to be eaten is selected. Um, and what makes it morally okay, not legally okay by the regular law, you know, but what makes it morally okay is the person has consented, but also that it's the dire, it's the necessity of it, you know? And in that case, with the ship at sea, with the shipwreck, obviously it's dire necessity. But you know, with Buffalo, I don't know a lot about this, but the little I read, it's that they're so central to the way people are surviving um, on the plains, especially. So could there be a kind of a combination? I feel like that consent, um, you know, kind of uh, aversion, I, I feel like that's a fairly familiar one I've heard before. But what I heard, Darcy, and what you were saying this time when you were telling the Buffalo child was also that need kind of aspect of it. And I was just wondering if that was something that, you know, you guys had thought about or, or, or would maybe want to comment on. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, so there's a story in Mi'kmaq culture about a man who is a hunter and uh, he's a hunter specifically of the moose. And he has a special relationship with the moose. And so um, there's a moose bone sitting in his house that the, his wife has been saving for him. And their kid has been playing with it. And uh, he, or in some cases, he, the, some story versions, he's uh, playing with a little bow and arrow. Anyway, the moose bone breaks. And uh, as a result, his father now has a broken leg in the woods because of the spiritual relationship between him and the moose. Um, and later in that story, the family is destitute and starving, and uh, he, the hunter who, who is also able to turn into a moose goes to his sister and says, listen, you have to kill me as a moose and, and feed the family. Uh, and so she does. And there, there's like a pretty graphic description of her <laughs> killing him with this ax. Um, but yeah, that element of like consent seems to be recurring theme in Mi'kma stories about animal death. So uh, Glooskap asks Martin whether it's okay to kill him. He doesn't just sneak up on Martin and snap his neck. Um, there's, there's this idea that animals uh, feel bad for human beings and can consent. And so the fear that you might accidentally eat someone who's a person uh, well, good luck getting rid of that problem because in Mi'kmaq culture, everyone's a person. Uh, I remember as a child discovering that rocks could have a spirit and then being afraid to walk on rocks and asking my dad, how do I tell if something is alive? And <laughs> the conversations that resulted from that, I think maybe we're slightly above child level, but um, really interesting and intriguing questions about like what, what does eating something mean and uh, how, do we, how do we contextualize that? Uh, yeah, and the, the urgent need comes again through the stories in Migma because a lot of the stories are about like it was a really harsh winter and then this happened. And so they're often contextualized specifically within uh, absolute subsistence hunting needs. So like you needed to eat that day kind of situation. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. And uh, yeah, so for, I mean, I, we, there's no, um, there is this idea, I guess, what we talk about is consent that flows through a lot of stories as well, right? And, and uh, like, for example, you can think about that Buffalo Child story as, as one about that. Um, and then we also have a moose story that's very similar about pipe and our ceremonies there. And, um, but it's more so like, uh, like, it's almost like a different frame. It's not about, you know, what is your right to eat is kind of like the way that when you talk about the law at sea as well and criminalization, it's more so the frame is about relationality and respect and kinship. And then so it's like there is, and then it goes into that, just like what you're saying, Margaret, as well, like subsistence, it was Buffalo, right? Because of the, the for Plains Creek 
just the numerous um, uh, the amount of buffalo were on the prairies. And it's, so it's interesting when you think about something like beavers, we actually never hunted them until, um, until some Plains Cree people engaged in the fur trade. And that was because it wasn't, um, there was no need for substance, but we also saw that they filled a very particular role in, in cleaning the land as well. And so, um, so yeah, so it's kind of like, I don't know how to put this. It's like this opposite than, you know, legal rights, obligations and, and, and barriers versus like this idea of relationality, kinship and respect that kind of like flows mm -hmm. in, in a different way, yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, both of you, for sharing. Um, I'm Melissa. Um, I'm from uh, the West Coast, the other side of the of this big old rock. Um, and over the past couple of months, I've been doing um, an internship, actually, from um, this Coast Salish woman who's very close to uh, where Darcy's uh, is from where close to Darcy is right now. Um, so she is uh, Coast Salish and New Chanu, and she's been sharing such a wealth of stories with me over the past summer. So this really resonated with me. And I was curious about if either of you have any stories um, that could teach us about um, law and our obligations to um, plant relations and how we're going about um, consuming them. Um, I'm wondering this because uh, my mentor, her, her, um, her name is Quatsnot, and she like really st stressed to me. I think because my project was like very canoe centered, that like whenever uh, her ancestors would have to go and take down a big red cedar tree, that and she used the words they would have to beg for that life um, for the cedar tree and explain like we need to make this canoe so that we can do this. Um, and that they also had, um, they knew how to build an entire house out of cedar bark without, without killing any trees. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if um, either of you have any of those stories um, and any implications from those. Do you wanna go first, Darcy? I've got some notes, but. Yeah, I mean, I can, I, you know, I'm, I can't, uh... I don't want to take up too much time telling us our stories are so long here, but um, <laughs> yeah, we. I mean, our our plant um, relations are really important, especially when we think about um, uh, ceremony. So part of it, I, I like the way you put it, Margaret, when you said, um, "What was it? The hermeneutic of suspicion, or I can't remember." Yeah, mm. is that a lot of our stories um, uh, that are preserved or shared um, are really part of this idea of. Um, um, since, you know, settlement of the prairies, I guess, um, to use that, that language, um, since uh, that, the, like, colonization, there's been a lot of sort of patriarchal focus on everything, including our stories, right? And so that's why a lot of our hunting stories exist and still are told within our communities as well, um, is because of that there, um, there was this um, division in, in knowledges between um, genders back in the day. And then so we've seen a lot of those. So there's been this resurgence of, of our plant stories that has been coming up, but um, where, it, where it has maintained, I guess, um, is within our ceremonies. And so for, I'll just give you an example. We have one of our ceremonies, we use um, uh, uh, choke cherries. It's really important on the prairies. Um, often choke cherries, um, I, I heard back in the day, were um, again these these this, these islands on the prairies where people could sustain themselves um, in, in the summer um, because where they were there was often water as well, and so we actually have this story about um, a choke cherry bush saving um, people, and then so we we use those choke cherries for our ceremonies as well, um, and that's kind of like. Um, not only knowing that they're they're a healing medicine, but also to give them that kind of like 
respect that we have there as well. And so there's a number of stories that we do have, particularly with particular trees as well, like um, fir trees, again, or evergreens, as we talk about them as on, on the prairies, um, because again, in the winter, they're providing shelter for people um, uh, there as well. And so, so that kind of knowledge is really returning, um, but um, can still be found deep within our ceremonies, yeah. Uh, the um, the thing that comes to my mind is the regulations or guidelines around medicine picking. So uh, the, I, the basic rule is don't pick all the medicine. So you know if we come across an area that has a bunch of sweet grass, we don't just clear it out and take it all home. Um, that the the idea is kind of like the bowl with one spoon idea that you're you you take as much as you need but no more. You have to leave some for the other animals for the other humans. Um, and I think you could extrapolate lessons from the way Mi'kmaq harvest birch bark, which doesn't kill the tree. Um, and so they use tall, fast growing trees to form the poles of the wigwam. And uh, then they actually transport that same dwelling from location to location. And so when we would go from our winter to summer homes and back again, that same house would go with you. You wouldn't go and harvest new trees and, and build a new home. You would take that same house with you. Um, and so during COVID, when things were getting so stressful, um, I started thinking about this don't pick all the medicine rule in terms of personal energy. Like, uh, don't <laughs> take all your personal energy, right, like don't <laughs> use it right down to the nub, so to speak. Uh, leave something uh, to, to regenerate. And so I, I think there are lots of ways that we can extrapolate from some of those practices to think about how do we show our consideration for the other beings that we share the space with. Thanks. Jess? Questions from the audience? The chat is quiet. Oh, Jess. Jess, your hand is up. Wonderful. Hello. Uh, thank you both so much. This was so interesting. And I, I feel like a, a popcorn machine. There's so many uh, connections and, I, and ideas. It's just been really wonderful to listen to. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about uh, as I was listening was this idea. So uh, McKinnon has this piece, a feminist fragment on animal rights, where she talks about this idea of the speaking for the other problem, which I think has a sort of multiple layers of valence when we're talking about uh, Indigenous legal orders. In particular, there's been this mention of the fact that so many uh, stories, you have to kind of rely on a narration that comes through, uh, you know, a kind of settler uh, recording. And uh, of course, there's these questions around uh, sort of recording and communicating uh, stories that include the voices of animals as one of the resources that are being drawn upon to understand our obligations. Um, and I think I, I just was curious if either of you are familiar with stories within your respective legal traditions that deal with this question or problem of speaking on behalf of somebody else and when uh, those kinds of intuitions uh, need to kind of uh, sort of be comfortable with imperfection uh, or ambiguity as Darcy kind of underlined uh, and whether or not that's something that's picked up in in specific relation to animals or just more broadly uh, in terms of uh, who's who speaks on whose behalf uh, in legal or other settings. Mm. Thank you so much. It's a good question, Jess. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is uh, there's a story about um, Glooscap and his brother Malsum. And the idea is that Glooscap has created uh, all of the animals to be friends with the human beings. And then he's got this sort of grouchy, mean brother Malsum who comes along and talks to the animals and convinces them that they're not getting anything out of this friendship with humans deal and uh, that they should really use their power and their strength to destroy and, and subjugate the humans. And so they do. Um, and then Blue's Cap comes back and discovers what shenanigans his brother's been up to um, and gets really mad about it. And so he teaches the humans to hunt. Uh, as sort of a revenge. 
Now, this story contradicts a bunch of other stories we have. And so there's multiplicity within the, the collection of stories. And so I think the issue of like who speaks for whom, uh, it depends on who's doing the storytelling because the same story can change quite a bit from storyteller to storyteller. Um, and so a lot of it depends on who the audience is, where they're at in their own personal uh, development cycle in terms of different stages of life. Um, and so you might be told the same story over the course of your life with very different intentions and sometimes very different content. Um, and so I think that issue of uh, who speaks for the, the people who can't speak, um, there can be a problematic tendency to assume that because indigenous people are indigenous to our territory, that we somehow are always going to be uh, friends to the animals and, and never do anything wrong. And the, the history just doesn't support that. <laughs> uh, we, we've done lots of terrible things. And so I think that problem of uh, who gets the authority to talk to animals um, there, or talk on behalf of animals, um, it, it's the same issue I think that happens with a lot of other subjugated beings. Uh, so it's, uh, it can be self-evident sometimes what might be in the best interest of particular beings in terms of, you know, beings need water, they need food, they need shelter. Um, but once you get into some of the more specific logistics, um, that's a conflict within our own communities as well. Yeah, so a really great question, Josh. And I don't have a specific story. I could be like, oh, this is the one that tells us about our <laughs> talking for the non. It really is like there's a line of stories like the one I shared there about Wasagi Chuck that is about um, it's just nudging us, right, as, as humans towards like there's more to this than, you know, hunting or. Mm -hmm gathering but like that relationship is really important right and so we have a number of that but I'll also say that's why I wanted to talk about like ceremonies is that um you know there's you know for example that mistassini story would be shared at ceremonies but also you would be fasting um sweat lodges the lodges we actually still use buffalo skulls as part of like the sacred um uh on the mound that we have as well and that's kind of like putting together this idea of respect right and so it seems so trite to to be in a conference and say well it's this it's you know it's just about respect um, but um from my minuscule experiences in our ceremonies is that you can start to see that how people who do have that sort of respected position within communities to speak about um for example buffalo have gone through these all these experiences and put those together. But what I also want to say, but there's again, our elders, we often have a saying that I've heard from my family and community that like these really old people who are really knowledgeable, they'll say things like, they're about to speak and they'll say, you know, excuse me, pardon me, I don't know much. And if I say anything that offends you, like yeah. pray for me, sometimes they'll say that. And um, and again, it's that kind of like ethic of imperfection, right? That you know, we're always striving towards that. And I think that kind of gets at your question, Jess, like what I see in them is like, oh yeah, they really acknowledge that they're not going to be able to speak for, for example, moose or sweet grass or those things. Yeah. Uh, Darcy, what about uh, clans in this regard? Like I know in Mi'kmaq, um, there's sometimes people who've written about how uh, if a particular family has a long-standing relationship with a particular animal, uh, they come to have uh, to be seen as part of that animal's family. So uh, a particular family might be long time engaged in hunting an animal or engaged in supporting its habitat. And so they come to be seen as like the bear people. Um, and so within a, our community, if someone from that bear clan were to say something about the bear, it would hold more weight than if someone who wasn't part of that clan said it. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's really great. Yeah, I often say like, we're like uh, clanless Cree out here. Uh, <laughs> and there's actually like, there's a lot of between the older people, they talk about um, whether there was clans or not. And I haven't really heard like, definitively, like, I'm thinking very specifically about Central Alberta, like Musquachies. Mm -hmm. um, but it, what I have seen is, is um, there are, there are people, for example, who, um, we have this word, it's called Pelagan, it's like their, 
um, their helper in their family. And those will often be like animals, right? So that could be like a mm. bear, muskrat, mouse, et cetera. And so those people would have that kind of knowledge that you're talking about, Margaret, or that um, understanding that they're close to that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sorry, the clam clamless cree was a joke. Back there, so <laughs> <laughs> um, Kelly here for those of you who cannot see me on the camera. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. The first is from Meg Parrott. So I'll read it now. I would love to hear more about if why extinction specifically could be considered ethically wrong from your perspectives. Would this be because of the severance of kinship, relation, kinship relationships? Is there something ethically different between the disappearance of the last member of a species versus the loss of an individual animal's life? Thank you so much. I love these presentations so much. Ooh, good question. Uh, so the Mi'kmaq have stories about animals that don't exist anymore. Uh, so for instance, the giant beaver, um, which as far as we can tell, hasn't existed in our territory for perhaps 8,000 years, um, but it does tell us how effectively oral traditions can pass on information. Uh, we used to sometimes hear talk about, oh, well, you know, the giant beaver was a metaphor for how important the beaver was to the people, and that's why the beaver was so large, and then they found giant beaver skeletons uh, <laughs> that changed that <laughs> perspective. Um, but I think when we talk about, uh, so we, we break uh, time periods up, uh, and one of the time periods is the time of the ancient peoples um, when there were these larger animals, and a lot of those animals did go extinct. Um, so that gets talked about as uh, almost its own separate uh, period of, of being that when the, the animals and the, the people live together in uh, a different kind of a world. And so I think there is an acknowledgement that there are certain demarcations that make everything after that point different. Um, I don't know that I've seen anything where people would be grieving the loss of those animals, but I do see in contemporary Mi'kmaq where people grieve the loss of specific animals uh, in their environment and then also work hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I think they're, the reason for uh, working against extinction is explicitly that feeling of obligation and relation. Uh, we don't might we might not feel that we have a relation to extinct animals from 8,000 years ago, but we certainly have an obligation in relation to the animals that we share our territories with now. And so, when you hear Mi'kmaq people talk about clear cutting, or you hear them talk about fracking, or you hear them talk about uh, plans to dump uh, effluent into a river, um, that kind of thing of th that's one of the things that gets people motivated to make change. And so, I think there are. Um, even if you believe that the spirit is going to come back again or that it will simply change form into a different animal, that doesn't mean that you don't try to protect that animal while it's here and living. That they're, the living have obligations, uh, just as we have obligations to the no longer living. Uh, it's, it doesn't end that way. How is the situation from your perspective, Darcy? Yeah, so we have, um, um, we don't have stories about giant beavers. I was just trying to think. <laughs> um, but what we do have is like, um, so this is such a great question is we actually have um, this whole history of stories about Buffalo, but we actually have this story about um, Buffalo. They came, they were birthed from this very specific lake on the prairies. Um, and um, as they went to near extirpation here, um, what came about was stories how the Buffalo returned to this lake because of how um, poorly they were being treated. So really tied into that Mistassini story. Mm -hmm. But we also have this other story about this creation of a lake where um, they eventually get over, over hunted. It's Buffalo Lake is the lake. And, um, and so when you look at the, all these stories together, um, we have these laws, these principles, like Pastahuin and Ochinuin, and those are really about transgressing and um, and transgressing the national na natural world, and that story of it's the story of Redberry Lake where they go back to the buffalo disappear from the earth is because um, of the transgressions that humans have done towards them. And so it really is this um, maybe not the language of extinction, but it's this idea of of an animal going away. Um, so it's very material because what we're actually seeing on the prairies now is a number of nations are um, reclaiming um, um, 
buffalo from a number of different herds um, from the point of extinction. Um, and so um, there's actually this kind of, kind of like what you're saying about like finding the skeleton, almost for us, like these, these stories were, yes, fantastical, but this idea there was always hope within them that they would return from that lake. And so that's actually what we're seeing um, metaphorically in, in our communities that um, there is more ability for nations to provide, you know, a good living for Buffalo and they're re actually returning to communities. Thank you both so much. The next question in the chat is from Tracy McDonald. It reads, thank you for two wonderful presentations. I really enjoyed both of them very much. I was wondering if there are those who advocate for veganism within the communities that you study. And if yes, are there ways to do so in the context of the stories and traditions that you both study? Uh, so Mi'kmaq have a value called non-interference, which is basically kind of don't get all up in my business. Um, that you don't really tell other people what to do, uh, which is one of the reasons that settlers often think that we're not parenting because they see us encouraging children to make decisions for themselves um, at a very young age to take responsibility for those decisions and their repercussions uh, and to, to think really deeply about uh, what some decisions might mean for them. And so the uh, idea that there are uh, people who would go out and kind of recruit you to veganism. Uh, it's not really a, a Mi'kmaq way of doing things. Uh, I think I've been vegan since 2008, and I have never, and uh, I really try not to, encourage people to become vegan. Uh, I think that's a decision everyone needs to make for themselves. And so uh, seeing the history where we've told Indigenous people how they should be living so frequently and uh, it's so aggressively, uh, it's not really something I would recommend at all. That said, I think when you start having conversations about what do some of these stories mean, what do some of these principles mean, how do we live these values, and then you speak honestly about what you're doing, I could see how that might encourage other people to think and do something similar in their own lives. And so uh, we model in Mi'kmaq that you, you uh, show people how to live by trying to live well, um, now, sometimes people who are doing things that are very bad or dangerous for others maybe need to take, be taken aside and told an important story about someone who did something similar and how poorly it turned out for them. Uh, I've, I've had that talk a couple of times from relatives, um, but uh, the idea that you would uh, try to sort of recruit someone for veganism, it's just not really a Mi'kmaq approach. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. And yeah, and so there's what, Two things. I would say there is this like idea of non-interference with Cree as well, and it's almost the opposite. Like there's a, like I uh, grew up in um, Alberta beef country. Uh, I love Alberta beef. Other uh, things, but and, like in Cree communities, it's just um, people just eat what they eat, and there is this um, because there is this hunting tradition that um, a lot of people do eat meat, right? Um, and uh, but there's never been any sort of like conflict or there's no like cultural mores or anything like that it's like people really just have the ability to choose what they do and um you know there, there's this buffalo child story when you think about it in one context mm -hmm. is this kind of idea of making a decision right on on how you're nourishing yourself in there and and our ceremonies the one thing that we do in our ceremonies is we do a lot of fasting and we do a lot of um refraining so to speak from things and what that actually does is I think it actually opens the door for um, people to make choices about you know how they're nourishing themselves as well and again um, Cree people are not a monolith so this is one particular community more towards the um, Rocky Mountains but um, some of their teachings that came out is they would actually um, have families who wouldn't just eat they would just they wouldn't eat meat for like a year or two just the idea of because their diet was so connected to the world around them because they were hunters they would they would make the choice not to hunt which meant they wouldn't eat meat for like a year right just to regenerate and to have that abundance in the territory as well and so so those those kind of like um uh that ground is out there within Cree communities for sure So thank you, everyone. I 
That concludes our opening plenary session and what a wonderful and generative way to start this conference on mass extinction. Wonderful. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thanks everybody. And uh, hopefully I have some other obligations, but hopefully I can pop in um, remotely as, as we continue here. Thank you, Darcy.